<laughs> okay, we're going to start recording now. Right. And now Facebook. Perhaps we'll wait till we get the magic 50 number, uh, Rabbi, and then we'll kick off. We're on, I can see we're on 47 at the moment. Sure. I'll let you know when it's live on Facebook and then we'll start. Okay, well, when it's live on Facebook, perhaps that's when we'll start. That is going live in a second. Okay, we're live. Okay, ready. Right, I think we're on um, face on Facebook now, aren't we? Yes, it's all on. Okay, well, a very good evening to the sixty-six participants. This is a joint initiative by Chigwell and Hainault Synagogue and by the Jewish Historical Society of England. And uh, we, it, it gives us great pleasure that we've got such a good number here tonight. And I would extend the warmest of welcomes to Colonel Richard Kemp, uh, who last joined uh, Chigwell and Hainault Synagogue in 2011, where, um, by all accounts, he gave a very inspirational talk. Um, the timing of this meeting um, could hardly be more apposite with all that's going on um, in the Middle East at the moment. But I would like to go back because the um, the meeting is entitled uh, From Balfour to Bibi. So initially, I would like to go back a hundred years or more to the Balfour Declaration 
Uh, but before I do that, I would just like to ask Colonel Kemp uh, about his own initiative. Uh, it's, a, it's a website called the Friends of Israel Initiative. And uh, perhaps you could just um, introduce us to uh, this particular initiative um, before we go back to 1917. If you could just yes. tell us how you became acquainted with it. Thank you. Yes, the, the Friends of Israel uh, initiative doesn't go quite as far back as 1917. <laughs> it goes back somewhere like, um, uh, I think it was around about 2010, thereabouts. And it was founded by Jose Maria Aznar, the former president of Spain. Um, and he put together a board of um, mainly former cabinet ministers um, from countries around the world, including Europe, the United States of America, um, and Australia, and for some former heads of state, for example, uh, John Howard, the former Prime Minister of Australia, um, and, and a number of others. And essentially, they were all not Jews. And the idea was that they would use their networks and their influence with existing governments, and many of them have been in government quite recently, to um, to, to try and do what they could to influence those governments to do the right thing in relation to Israel. Um, and obviously there are times when some governments, um, you know, don't necessarily see and understand the full picture. And, uh, you know, the role of this organization was to try and influence them uh, to, to think about things in a different way. And that didn't just apply to states, it also applied to things like the United Nations. We have meetings with the, with the Secretary General of the UN. Uh, it applies to organizations like the EU, where we also have uh, high-level meetings. Um, uh, today, Jose Maria Aznar has been succeeded as chairman by Stephen Harper, the former Prime Minister of Canada. Um, and one of uh, our board members also is, um, is John Baird, a for, uh, Harper's former Foreign Secretary. So it's, it's a pretty high-powered organization. Um, it also has within it uh, a group called the High Level Military Group, which is made up of about 15, the numbers vary, about 15 uh, retired generals, again, from around the world, different countries in, from you know, Latin America, North America, Europe, Australia, um, France, Germany, Italy, uh, Great Britain, and one of, the, one of the British board members of the organization is David Trimble. Um, and so it's, it's basically uh, a, a group that it's not well known because it doesn't exist really for the purposes of its own publicity, as some of these groups obviously do need to publicize themselves. We tend to operate below the radar horizon to a large extent. We don't do anything that's secret. We don't, um, we don't uh, do anything that we wouldn't want to be open about, but it's normally we find better to operate um, without shouting too much about it, to, to exert the maximum influence and work behind the scenes a bit to, uh, to try and um, do what we can in the interests of Israel. And, we, and the interests of Israel is obviously a big question that some, a lot of people would find hard to define. We don't consider them necessarily to be the precise interests of the current Israeli government. We look at it uh, collectively from our, our own perspective and and make, come to the conclusions we think are the right ones, um, irrespective of, of what the Israeli government may think at the time. But generally speaking, I think it would be true to say that our, our views are pretty much aligned with, uh, with what the government of Israel is thinking. Obviously not much in, not in every single area of policy, but in, in the key, particularly in the key foreign defense security policies. I, re I remember that the initiative uh, came out with a particular policy with regard to the Golan Heights. Um, can you assert whether you had, that had any particular influence, that stand that you took, um, and whether you see any similarities between the Golan Heights and the uh, territories in uh, Judea and Samaria at the moment? Well, it's, all, it's always... Um hard to say exactly what influence we may or may not have um it's it, quite hard to measure and I, you know I, I couldn't sort of say well this the, these countries those countries um accepted what we said and so on but i but i think many you know many countries and international organizations take into account what we say um and in relation to the golan heights we i think we supported um the u.s government and the israeli government's uh, decisions to 
um, to essentially to, to recognize Israel's sovereignty in the Golan Heights. And we haven't yet made a public comment on, um, on the situation in Judea and Samaria. Um, obviously, there are some similarities and there are some significant differences. But I think it's true to say, depending on how things unfold, that the Friends of Israel Initiative will be releasing, probably be writing to heads of state of a number of countries around the world and international organizations like the UN um, and express our views. And we would normally publish those sort of letters and documents on our website. Thank you very much. So, as I said, we were going to start off with Balfour. So, what I'd like to ask you now is what you think was the main motivating factor? What animated the great Gentile Zionist of a hundred years ago? So Balfour, Lloyd George, Churchill, Smuts, um, and another Colonel, Colonel Josiah Wedgwood, and finally, um, Ord Wingate. So do you, do you feel that you have something in common with those, with those men? Well, I, I, I have something in common with a lot of um non-Jewish Zionists, including, of course, Margaret Thatcher, David Cameron, Boris Johnson, and a full range of other politicians in this country, and, and many military people. I speak a lot to military people serving and retired about this issue, and very few of them disagree with my perspective, particularly on the IDF and how the IDF operates. Obviously, many of them have different views on things like the legality of the so-called settlements in Judea and Samaria, and, and, and no doubt when it comes up, the Israeli sovereignty issue there. Um, but but it's, it's, I think many people who follow and understand the Middle East, uh, Jews or non-Jews, um, they, they, unless they have a, a sort of, I think, a, a, a reason to oppose it, a, a political reason to oppose it, I think most people support the state of Israel. And what supporting the state of Israel means is not supporting every policy of the government of the state of Israel, not supporting any one party in the state of Israel, and certainly not supporting everything that Israel does, in it, either at home or, or overseas, but supporting the right of the state of Israel to exist as a sovereign state, which is, of course, denied by the BDS movement and many other people who oppose Israel. They actually oppose the existence of the state of Israel, even though they don't all admit to that. I think we know that in many cases that happens to be true. But going back to um, 100 years ago, the Balfour Declaration, it was, it was uh, the, dec the, the public initiative of Lord Balfour, but it had the support and the backing, uh, of course, of David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister at the time. And he, had, he identified very strongly with the Jewish state. And he saw many similarities between uh, what the Jews were trying to do in what was then the, the Palestinian area. Um, and his own native land, Wales. Um, and he visited uh, Palestine and, and uh, you know, some of, if you look at some of the things he said about it, he was extremely complimentary and optimistic as to the future of that land as a, as a Jewish state. The, the, the motivation for the Balfour Declaration obviously is quite complex. And one thing I would say before proceeding is that many people see the, the Balfour Declaration as perhaps a, an imperial diktat by the United Kingdom. It wasn't that at all. It was agreed, at, as a Balfour Declaration, it was agreed by the major powers in the world, including the United States of America, that we weren't fighting. The ones we weren't fighting against agreed it. So all the major powers, France, Japan, various other powers around the world, um, supported this declaration. Uh, and as I say, the reasons behind it were a little bit complicated, and they range from, I think, the, the natural feeling of justice towards the, um, the Jews' desire to establish um, their own uh, state in the Middle East. Uh, and that, of course, was heavily influenced by personal connections between British politicians and other politicians in the world and influential Jews in this country. Um, but th there were other factors as well, one of which was. Um, uh, Heim Weizmann, who was extremely influential in this declaration, the contribution he was making to the war effort, um, which was absolutely phenomenal, fundamental, developing um, acetate that could be used to create, to manufacture explosives in the quantities needed by the British Army uh, and Navy and Air Force. And 
uh, and that you know that that wasn't a single a single reason for supporting it but of course that sort of contributed to his influence in in high places also there was i think a, a thought that by supporting a jewish state um there would be an increase in levels of support among jews in other countries for the for the allied war effort including in the united states of america uh, and and elsewhere so i think it was you know there wasn't it wasn't solely a a kind of a, a you know a, a, a desire to see a jewish state but but i think there was also selfish interests at heart which is hardly surprising given the horrific situation that britain and, and our allies were in at the time the whole world was in at the time mm. um i think you know one <coughs> of the things that, that should be looked at alongside the balfour declaration and the balfour declaration was undoubtedly one of the key events that led to the recreation of the state of israel in 1948 even though it was a bumpy road from 1917 to then but we should always look alongside the balfour declaration at events on the ground and uh, there was a, a huge fight going on in um the land of palestine a, a defensive war effectively by the british empire against the ottoman empire a defensive war in which um fortunately the british empire prevailed and had it not done so had we not destroyed the ottoman empire and thrown them out of that land of course there's no reason to believe that today uh, the land that is now the state of israel would not be in the hands of um uh of of the turks or someone else but there's no reason to think it should be now the land of israel if it hadn't been for that enormous fight involving huge numbers of british empire forces australians New Zealanders, British, and and a Jewish element, as I'm sure you're well aware, within the uh, the British Army, the, the Jewish Legion, which was led by a British Christian called John Patterson, uh, and made up of Jews from Britain, the United States of America, Russia, Palestine itself, and from countries around uh, around the world uh, who who fought, some of whom had fought with the Zion Mule Corps in Gallipoli. And, um, and and they fought in in 1918 during the campaign. They were formed in 1917 and fought in 1918, and made a huge contribution to that battle. And and the other element again that people may or may not be familiar with is a group called Nili, which was a a Jewish spy organization set up in Palestine to spy on the Ottomans and and provide information to the British forces. And General Allenby, who was the commander out there at the time, his um, his chief of intelligence said after the war that had it not been for the intelligence provided by Nili, often at the risk and actually the loss of some of their people's lives, uh, including Sarah Aronson, who was one of the leaders who committed suicide rather than be tortured uh, to give information about the network to the Turks, which was a serious threat to her at the time. Um, had it not been for their intelligence, then the, the, the campaign against the Turks probably would have been won, but it would have been a lot more costly in, in British lives and taken a lot longer. Thank you. Um, Lord Balfour described what he envisaged as the Jewish home in Palestine as a tiny notch when he addressed a large crowd in the Albert Hall in the early 1920s. Um, and of course, we know that it was Winston Churchill who severed um, Eastern Palestine and uh, created a country called Transjordan. Um, so do you think the, the present boundaries of Israel, including Judea and Samaria, were roughly what Churchill and Balfour envisaged? Because it does seem to be some vagueness in the early days as to the deline delineation of the boundaries. I think, I think in the early days there was, and I think that um, Balfour um, and those people who supported the Balfour Declaration in 1917 foresaw a much larger area being assigned to the Jewish state, which did include, um, as you suggest, Ju uh, the Transjordan, now, now the state of Jordan or the kingdom of Jordan. That, that changed over time. It was, and, and in fact, when it was assigned, when the, the, the mandate of Palestine was assigned to Britain to create as a Jewish state, a Jewish national homeland, by the San Remo um, uh, resolution in 1920, as part of the settlement of the First World War, part of the peace talks of the First World War. Um, my understanding is that, that the, the entire area fell within that remit. 
But for whatever reason, Britain decided to carve out um, just a smaller area to be a Jewish national homeland and allocate what is a pretty large area, um, Transjordan, um, as a, an Arab nation. And of course, several other Arab nations were formed at the same time. Um, I, you know, some people kind of hark back to that those days and say, well, you know, really, the Israel should include all of that area. But of course, it's ridiculous to, to, to even contemplate something like that because, you know, history is what it is and the lines are where they are now. And um, I don't think anyone, any serious uh, politician or observer even would, would question um, Jordan's right to exist as it exists today. One of the two members of the wartime cabinet who opposed the Balfour Declaration was a Jewish man called Edwin Montague. Um, and he, the main criticism which he lodged, which has been in, echoed down the, the years, is that the local inhabitants weren't consulted. And Balfour himself at the Albert Hall said that uh, the, the, the question of the local inhabitants should be one that should be dealt with with sympathy and tact. And Churchill also said that the local inhabitants should not feel that they were being uprooted or supplanted. Um, how successful do you think Israel has been in dealing with that particular criticism of the Balfour Declaration? Well, I... I, I... <laughs> I think that um, it, it was at what was actually said, I believe, both at, in the Balfour Declaration and in the San Remo Resolution, was that nothing should be done to prejudice the rights, the, the, I think the, the um, religious and the, uh, the social rights of, um, of other people living there apart from the Jews, which obviously predominantly was, was Arabs. Um, and the, the, the truth is that pretty much from the beginning, certainly, if not from the very beginning, and some Arab leaders did actually, were, were happy with the recommendations of proposals, but, but it wasn't very long um, before uh, a huge amount of the Arab world, not just Arabs living in what had been the Mandate of Palestine, but, but Arab countries around the Middle East, um, vehemently opposed the existence of a Jewish state and yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, there are various different interpretations as to what the Jews and then Israel itself did in relation to trying to reconcile the Arab population to the presence of a Jewish state. Um, but in my opinion, um, I think it was something that was irreconcilable. I don't think it's compatible to be to say that um, that uh, you know the 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 Arabs will accept. Uh, a Jewish ruled part of what they consider to be their land. And yes, we're seeing today a very different approach from uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Oman, Bahrain, Egypt, and Jordan. We're seeing a very different approach towards the state of Israel today. Of course, Egypt and Jordan have had peace treaties with Israel for a long time. But what we're seeing now with other countries that were in the long term hostile to the Jewish state, we're seeing an affinity. And I spent some time in Saudi Arabia fairly recently and had meetings with some of the senior members of government out there. And the general feeling among the people I spoke to was that they would like now, they would like as a country to recognize the Jewish state, but they're facing opposition from, um, from the ordinary Arab people in their streets who they say would find it hard to accept. But what they, what, what, but in the absence of a formal relationship between um, uh, between uh, Israel and some of these Arab countries, they're working very hard behind the scenes uh, and and operating in some cases with Israel behind the scenes um, in 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 their mutual interest. And I think that you know one thing that has changed their views on this is that. Um, they, they, they have a, a collective fear of Iran. Iran is, for them, the big enemy. And they see Israel as being probably the one reliable ally they've got in the Middle East that can stand up against Iran. And they see their interests as being, as colliding with Israel or aligning with Israel um, over that issue. And I, I don't say that they've suddenly all fallen in love with the Jews or with Israel. They haven't. 
but certainly on a on a maybe even a long term basis, I think they they uh, they you know that, that we we can we can expect to see a development of this relationship to the extent, for example, that that they, th these Arab countries have not vehemently opposed, as you might expect them to, Israel's plans to uh, to uh, implement sovereignty in parts of Judea and Samaria, and even the Jordanians who um, who are obviously particularly concerned about it. I don't expect them to oppose what is planned. Uh, yes, of course, they will publicly speak out about it, but they recognize where their interests lie, and they lie more with the state of Israel than they do with the Palestinian Arabs in uh, Judea and Samaria and in Israel itself, who, who obviously do strongly oppose what's proposed. I think I've lost the sound for a moment. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello? Oh, you can. Okay. I think I've just lost you for a moment. Um, right. Can we take a look now, please, go fast forwarding a few years to um, Resolution 242 after the Six Day War. Um, and this was something that was um, passed by the whole of the Security and Council, including the United States and the Soviet Union. And, it's, and it spoke of the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory um, after all war. Um, now, what is your belief um, from the international lawyers and historians that you've spoken to um, about acquiring territory in a defensive war? Do you, do you think that, um, I think you've argued that the Golan Heights were acquired in a defensive law, war, but do you feel much the same applies to Judea and Samaria? Well, let's let's go back to, uh, to to the history of Judea and Samaria in in modern times, and and of course Judea and Samaria was part of the land allocated by the San Remo Declaration, um, which the San Remo de Declaration remains binding in law, um, and would and form part of the uh, the founding constitution of the United Nations. It remains binding through the United Nations, and a part of that area which is allocated to be the Jewish homeland was Judea and Samaria. So from that point, uh, if you accept the legitimacy of the San Remo Declaration and the Constitution of the United Nations, then um, you really have to accept the fact that from the beginning, this land was part of the Jewish national homeland. Um, and the, it was illegally invaded by Jordan in 1948 and seized by Jordan and carved off from the Jewish national homeland in Jordan. So um, let, let us say, for example, that uh, Judea and Samaria had not been part of the Jewish national homeland back then, um, but had been an area that was legally occupied by Jordan, which it wasn't, um, then th that, that sort of makes it more closely aligned to the Golan Heights. And, and you could say that um, in, in, in a defensive war, which Israel fought in 1967, it had legitimately seized back that, or it had seized that territory, which it considered to be necessary for its own defense. Uh, it, it having been proven uh, in, you know, during the previous conflict, being proven that this was a, an area from which Israel would be attacked if it didn't control it. And the same is true of the Jordan, of the Golan Heights. But, but that's not the situation. That, so, so I think, you know, if, if it was a direct comparison, I think, yes, I would say that Israel can legitimately or could legitimately hold Judea and Samaria uh, as the conquest of a defensive war in order to prevent um, another war which, in which that territory could be used against Israel. But it wasn't like that. It was the reality was that this was always part of the, the Jewish state, always intended to be part of the Jewish state since San Remo. And, um, uh, and, and therefore, Israel was simply taking back what had been illegally taken by it by an invasion from Jordan. Yep, I'm afraid the sound's gone again a little there. Um, just uh, as far as San Remo is concerned, um, do you think that to some extent that was superseded by uh, United Resolution 181 in 1947 when partition 
was was voted upon. Do you think that superseded San Remo? Well, there is an argument for that, but um, of course, a resolution of the United Nations was not binding. It's not binding in international law in the same way as that treaty law created at San Remo. So it, it couldn't really, in, in that way, um, supersede the San Remo Agreement. But the reality is that um, the, the Jewish leadership did accept that resolution. So they accepted it. They accepted the, yeah. the plan to partition um, that land and allocate some of it to Arabs and some to Jews. But they did so at a time when I, I think, I mean, I can't read into their minds, but I'm sure they had a hope or an expectation that if they did accept that, um, that they would be able to live in peace in a smaller land than they'd originally hoped for, but at least to live in peace with their Arab neighbours. But it, it, it was obvious from when they declared, they accepted that and declared the state of Israel and the Arabs rejected it, outright rejected it in the form of an invasion by five Arab armies. Um, it was obvious that that wasn't going to be the case. So, you know, the, 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 the resolution we're talking about was not accepted really at all. It, it was never certainly legally binding and it wasn't accepted by the other side. So I don't, I don't think it would be right to say, I mean, you know, other, other people obviously disagree and, um, you know, I'm sure international lawyers would make a great deal of money arguing and debating the point. But from from my perspective, I don't think it's right to say that um, that 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 resolution superseded the San Remo uh, declaration. Uh, you made a film with uh, producer Hugh Kitson. I believe it was called Whose Land Is It? Can you just give us a little bit of the history as to how that film came to be made and, and what you actually got out of making it? Because I, I thought it was an extremely well well put together production. Yeah, I, I would... I mean, uh, at, at the risk of self-publicity, I, <laughs> uh, I would recommend that your viewers who haven't seen it might want to watch it because what that film, Hugh Kitson, I should say, is a very accomplished Christian filmmaker who has made many, many uh, Christian films. And he's made se several films as well about, about Israel, the Jewish state, and, and so on. Um, but he, he put this film, he wrote the film. Um, I helped him to an extent with the script, but he overwhelmingly wrote the film. And, um, and directed it. And I was uh, the presenter, the on-screen presenter. So unfortunately, if people do watch, I have to put up in my ugly mug for about an <laughs> hour and a half or whatever it is. Um, but essentially what that does, that film takes um, its viewers through from before the, um, the Balfour Declaration and, and does it effectively what is a conducted tour through um, the, the history and the law as it relates to the state of Israel today. And it includes, I think, at least five, we'll interview at least five or six renowned international lawyers um, and a number of historians as well. So it's a sort of pretty comprehensive look at the history and the legalities. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's in three parts and so far only part one has been made. Um, I, I believe part two and part three are ready to go, but just yeah. waiting for some, uh, some cash to enable it to, to be, to be uh, completed. <laughs> now, the Oxford Union were notorious for passing a resolution around the time of Munich that uh, they would not fight for king and country. And you've had the experience of entering into the lion's den at the Oxford Union and defending Israel. Um, what was your impression of the students there? Uh, do you think a lot has changed since just before the Second World War in their somewhat perverse opinions about things? Or how did you find it, all the hostile questioning? Well, I, 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 the, there, was, there was hostile questions, but I, I, I wouldn't actually categorize them really as hostile. I don't, you know, there were certainly no uncivil questions. It was. It was all, the whole debate was, con which I think had three of us on each side, something like that, was conducted in a very civilized fashion. Um, and there was some extremely, after the way the Oxford Union works in that particular debate I'm talking about, um, the students who are not part of the debating teams the other, on either side can make speeches at the end, in short speeches. And a number of them did, and I was deeply impressed by all of them. I, I can see why, I, mean, I never went to Oxford, in fact, I never went to any university. 
but I can see why these young people are at Oxford. Um, and I, I, you know, I think many, I, I spoke to quite a few people afterwards who said they had been influenced by the comments that were made by both sides, which is extremely refreshing to hear. You know, I think one, one tends to often mischaracterize students as rejecting one particular argument that doesn't suit their own, their own view of life. I don't think that's necessarily the case uh, in, in everyone. I think some of the most vocal ones are. And in fact, I was at Bristol University as well, speaking together with a, a retired IDF general recently um, on all of these subjects. And th th there was a demonstration outside, a po uh, you know, um, demonstrating against me and this IDF general, which is not anything that's unusual. And there were some pretty vocal members of the audience inside. Um, afterwards, I met some of the demonstrators in a pub and spoke to them over a beer. And they, were, they had been vehemently opposed to what I'd said and to what the general had said. But actually on, on further discussion in a, in a kind of calm atmosphere, I, I wouldn't say they changed their minds, but they certainly told me that they hadn't ever heard that perspective before. So I think that's the, the lesson I would take from Oxford Union, from Bristol and from various other universities I've spoken to in the United Kingdom and the US and elsewhere, including Australia. Um, is, is that unfortunately, young people today um, get too much influence from those who are opposed to Israel. Um, they often come from their left-wing university professors, I don't say in every case, but often they do. Uh, and, 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 and often it's, it's very difficult, as, and as I'm sure most of the people who are watching this will understand, it's very difficult for Jewish students at the universities to stand up and and tell the truth, partly because people won't listen to them in many cases, and partly because they're not given a platform to do so. Um, so I, I don't think, you know, I, I, I think the real problem is that is the, the one-sided approach and the conditioning of students' minds, and the, 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 the ease by which some universities allow pressure group BDS organizations, so-called pro-Palestine organizations, which are actually not pro-Palestine at all, they do nothing for Palestine, they're actually anti-Israel, um, the ease by which they can know platform speakers. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't hold the same view as many other people do about um, students, uh, having met many of them, modern students. I, I think, you know, many of them are open-minded, many of them are willing to debate and discuss and consider other things. Um, but they often, so often, too often, just aren't given the chance. Uh, and the same really applies in high schools. I think that's where one of the biggest problems lies, because in in you know in, in high schools, and I've been to many of those as well. Um, that you know that's that is the place where uh, they that they begin to learn the seeds of a, a one-sided biased argument because again they're not exposed to to a range of arguments there, and that I think is a, a you know an area that that those who are interested in educating young Jewish students should look closely as well because. You know, in, in, the, in the army, we would say you don't send a, um, a, a soldier to fight without training him first. And many, many Jewish students go to Jewish schools where, you know, they don't get the same kind of opposition to themselves and to the Jewish state as they find in many state schools. But yet they do when they go to university. And so I think, you know, at Jewish schools, that's the place really where young Jews should be prepared to to understand and to be ready and able to express the arguments that even so many of them are not able to, to get their heads around themselves. Now I've got a few questions from uh, people that have sent me emails before we, we um, spoke tonight. And um, I just, before we come to those, I just want to ask you about the, the role of um, the Jews in the diaspora. Um, what do you think of uh, the pressure that the Board of Deputies is coming under, of which I'm a member, to make some kind of statement about the policies of the Israeli government? Um, do you think we should mind our own business, or do you think we have an obligation to, to, to get stuck into the debate? Well, I, it's far be it from me to, um, to, to... <laughs> to stick my neck into um, <laughs> the, 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 the lion's den that is Jewish uh, politics in the UK. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty familiar with a lot of it. I know many people on all sides who are involved with the debate, but I wouldn't want to give them guidance okay. as to what they should do. What, what I would say is that 
uh, I do believe that um, that Jewish organisations um, in the UK have not only a right but a responsibility to speak out in relation to Israel. Obviously, what they say and the way they say it depends on their perspective and their views. But I do believe that they should be doing so because you you know better than I do. There are plenty of other people who oppose the state of Israel, who are only too ready and willing to let, make their voices loud and clear. Um, and I, I would suspect it's true. I, I mean, I know there are exceptions, but I think very few exceptions. I think it's true that the overwhelming majority of Jews in Britain support the state of Israel. They may not support everything it does. Many of them may not support their plans for the uh, implementation of sovereignty in Judea and Samaria. But fundamentally, they, of course, support the state of Israel, and they should support the state of Israel. Let's not forget, let's not forget for a minute what happened before there was a state of Israel. I know I, I don't want to lecture people and tell them never again, but you know that better than I do. Um, but th that one thing in the world, that one uh, state, powerful state in the world, is what will prevent the same thing happening again if it ever does and we've we're, we're seeing worrying signs of anti-semitism growing anti-semitism in different countries and for jews their their ultimate savior i think would be the jewish state and i don't mean necessarily just those jews in the jewish state um, but let's think what might have happened if if uh, significant jewish firepower had been available during the time of the of the holocaust it wasn't but if it had been, things might have been different. Um, but, but today it is there. And I've no doubt that uh, should, not, not obviously I'm not talking about exactly the same situation, but should Jews be significantly threatened in large numbers, then of course, I think they will be defended by the state of Israel if it possibly can. And of course, ultimately, it's, it's a place to take refuge if you need to. And, and I think, you know, I'd ha I hate to say this, and I hate to see and hear about Jews either leaving the UK or uh, considering and planning the possibility of leaving the UK. Um, one, because we should be a much more civilized country than a country that would allow a situation where a section of our society, whoever they are, live in fear of their future and existence in our country. And two, on a more selfish level, because we need them over here. The Jews make a, uh, and, and I hope I'm not being patronizing when I say this, but, but I know what a massive contribution the Jews make to our country, disproportionate to their numbers. Uh, and, and that also, by the way, goes for the state of Israel. The contribution that the Jewish state makes to the security, the trade, the technology, and the defenses of the United Kingdom, it absolutely outweighs the size and stature of the Jewish state. Thank you. I have a question here from Anton Delin, who lives in Israel, who used to live in the UK. Uh, what are we to make of the mixed messages coming from Washington? He's obviously referring to the Trump plan and um, the sort of different remarks that we hear from Mike Pompeo or different members of the administration, um, Ambassador Friedman, as to whether the Netanyahu is correct in taking unilateral measures. What do you think of the way Washington is thinking at the moment? I, I've, I've met quite a few times with members of the, uh, the Trump administration who have been involved in developing these plans. Um, and I, I believe that um, fundamentally the Trump administration and the president himself are behind what they themselves have proposed. But of course, it's, you know, the, nothing in, in the military, we, we say, no plan survives contact with the enemy. So um, you have to be ready to change and adjust and reshape your plans as situations unfold. And I think in the Trump administration, we perhaps see more of that, more turbulence than, um, than in many other administrations, many other countries, because President Trump is not a kind of lifelong, predictable political, political figure. Um, so, yeah, the, the, I, I wouldn't like to predict how it will work out. I would say that um, I, I think that given that, um, the, that the, the, the political consensus in Israel 
the unity government that exists in Israel, the emergency government, whatever they're calling it, that exists in Israel, which crosses not necessarily the full spectrum, but crosses a wide spectrum of Israeli politics, is in favour of um, of the uh, the plan to implement sovereignty, and I think that carries a huge amount of weight with the American administration. It's quite hard for them to go against a, a consensus position uh, from the Israeli government, even if they wanted to do so. Um, and I think what what uh, all, all I would say from from my knowledge of current events is that it's it's there is a great deal of diplomatic work going on now, right now, as we're speaking behind the scenes, to, to get Israeli and US policies on this fully aligned and how that will work, quite how, what the alignment will be, I'm not sure. But one thing I would say is that, um, that people often don't understand or recognize or want to recognize is that um, a part, a big part of um, the, the US proposals, in particular the part that says that they will support Israel's decision to, um, to extend sovereignty into parts of Judea and Samaria, incidentally only into parts of Judea and Samaria where there are very few Arabs living, most of the population by far are Jewish. Um, so we're not talking about a proposal that seizes land from Arabs. Um, but but the, the, the decision um, by the Israeli government or the, 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 the agreement to support Israel's government decision to implement sovereignty in parts of Judea and Samaria is conditional on Israel's prime minister's agreement to enter into negotiations towards the creation of a separate Palestinian state. And that is a requirement of President Trump before the US will accept these proposals. Um, and it's a long and complicated subject, and I'm sure there are many, many varied views both here and in Israel on this. But in my humble opinion, for what it's worth, um, I believe that these proposals represent the greatest opportunity for the Palestinian people. I'm not worried about the Israelis, I'm not worried about the Jews. Israel is a secure state and it has a long term future. It lives in prosperity, it's, being, it's developing itself, it's growing uh, in its uh, economic position, albeit we've got uh, setbacks now, but it's, it's not a country that people need to be concerned about. The Palestinians are a people that people do definitely need to be concerned about because they're off, many of them are living in squalor and uncertainty and dire economic conditions. And they're the ones that should be supported. We should be supporting them. And I believe, it may be counterintuitive, but I believe that the best way to support those people and give them some kind of a decent future, which they deserve as much as anybody else, is to see this, um, the, this current proposal through, if it can be. And the reason I say that is because this is a rather different proposal from what we've seen before in decades of peace processing. We've never really seen a situation before where Israel has not simply had to make concession after concession after concession, and the Arabs have had to do nothing, knowing that if they do nothing and agree nothing and accept nothing, they won't lose out by it. They will simply continue to pocket international aid into the pockets of their leaders, which is meant for their people and doesn't ever go there. Um, and they, they, are, they have been betraying their own people. Well, this, if anything stands a chance of success, I think this does, because the idea that it is different and the idea that um, we could continue with a process that's virtually unchanged for decades uh, in trying to create a two-state under previous parameters. Um, if, you, if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results, that is the definition of insanity. Um. You had experience to investigate conditions in Gaza um, during both of the, the, Gaza, the Gaza conflicts. Um, and as we're probably all aware, the International Criminal Court is trying to put Israel in the dock, although Israel has not submitted to the jurisdiction of the court on the ground that it believes the court to be biased. Um, how do you think this is all going to play out? It's a really good, really good question and a, a very current one. 
essentially the International Criminal Court has been trying to get Israel into their dock for a long, long time now. And many other people, the Palestinian leadership, the United Nations itself, particularly the Human Rights Council, many other anti-Israel organizations around the world have been desperate to get into Israel into the dock of a proper international criminal court. And that doesn't mean, of course, let's not forget, it doesn't mean Israel going into the dock itself. Yeah, of course, Israel is, is being effectively tried, but, but you don't put a country into the dock of the ICC, you put individuals in there. So the individuals that will go into the dock if this goes forward will be, potentially will be um, former prime, the prime minister, former prime ministers, um, cabinet ministers, generals, lower ranking soldiers, other politicians, civil servants, they are the ones that will be prosecuted with war crimes, um, not the country. The country is not going to be prosecuted because it can't happen. Um, and so, of course, you know, the spectacle that is required is to see international arrest warrants, even before a trial, to see international arrest warrants issued on people like Benjamin Netanyahu, Bugi Yalon, um, other, other former cabinet ministers, former generals, chiefs of staff, and so on. International arrest warrants issued to them to give evidence um, uh, in, in this case, even before it came to trial. And that, of course, would uh, shut down their ability to travel to, um, to many countries around the world. It would also, because of the, the, the perceived legitimacy of the international court, would convince many people who are not now convinced or reinforce in the minds of those who are, reinforce the fact that Israel, the, the Israelis, the IDF, the government are criminals, which they're not. Um, and war criminals is what, what, we're, being, what we're talking about. And um, that, that in itself is, is a further incitement to violence against Israel and against Jews around the world. So that's, that's the way it, it could unfold if a decision is taken by the pre-trial um, uh, panel that is meeting to consider jurisdiction at the moment, if, if they decide to actually to indict these, uh, the state of Israel in this situation or its, its leaders. And th what they've been doing up until now is that the prosecutor, Mrs. Ben Souda, the chief prosecutor of the court, has been effectively contorting the the court's constitution and the court's authority in a way that that gets Israel into the dock and I mean I don't want to bore everybody I'm sure you can look it up online but I, I don't want to bore you extensively with the way this has been happening but um, that, 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 that the entire unfortunately the entire legitimacy of the International Criminal Court is um, is going to be called into question because of this. And 11 member states of the International Criminal Court lodged objections to this procedure going ahead, member states, which is unprecedented, because they also see that this particular political prosecution is going to, to damage the standing and the reputation of the International Criminal Court itself. And I think the, the final thing on this is that, which people should understand is that Britain and the United States of America are also in the, in the uh, crosshairs of the International Criminal Court. They're, 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 they're hoping to launch full-scale investigations into allegations of British war crimes in Iraq and US war crimes in Afghanistan. And so they're focusing on the three countries, three countries in the world, uh, which are willing and prepared to use military force, but also have well-established, highly respected legal systems of their own. And the International Criminal Court is not designed to bring uh, cases against countries which are able and willing, and all three countries are and have proven track records of it, to, to try their own people. So in, in my opinion, it's a travesty. Uh, if it happens, it will be a greater travesty, and I hope it doesn't. We will find out probably in the forthcoming few weeks. Uh we're coming to an end now because it's not far from nine o'clock although i think we started at five past eight um i th just want to conflate a couple of questions from uh, anton delin and tal Ofer, um who now lives in the uk but used to live in israel and he's a member of the board of deputies 
Um, they point out to the fact that there are plenty of members from the IDF and the Shin Bet who are opposed to the unilateral assertion of sovereignty or the extension of civilian law to parts of Judea and Samaria. Um, do you think their, their views should carry weight as a military man? And what do you think will be the, the new security arrangements that will be required if Israel goes ahead? I think, um, I'm assuming, without um, knowing exactly who is being discussed here, I'm assuming that we're talking about retired members of Shin Bet and the IDF. I don't think it would be possible mm. any more than in this country for... Um, for serving officials to speak out against government policies. I think we're talking about retired, uh, retired ones. And I, I have seen um, them speaking out, some of them speaking out, and I've seen some of them speaking out about other allegations being made against Israel and other, other, uh, other things that go against the Israeli government. And of course, it's right and proper. Um, and of course, people, when they, when they listen to what uh, experienced former officials who often have had uh, many, many years of dedicated and distinguished service to the state of Israel, of course, they should be given due weight. Um, like, like, you know, not like anybody else, really, but perhaps even more so than anybody else. Uh, and, and equally, we have in this country, we have um, generals, retired, retired civil servants speaking out uh, against government policies here. In, what, in particular, you know, we saw quite a lot of retired civil servants and diplomats. And I think some General speaking out against the, the government's plans for Brexit. So, it, you know, you get it anywhere. And I, I, I wouldn't, I, I certainly wouldn't expect that to blow the government off course. In terms of the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the security of, uh, in the Jordan Valley, many different proposals have been put forward for, for that. And there was a thing called the Allen Plan, which was produced under President Obama as part of his proposals and John Kerry's proposals for peace. Um, and the Allen Plan was written by General John Allen, who was a highly distinguished United States Marine Corps general, and that envisaged uh, huge reliance on technical capabilities in the Jordan Valley and in, in, inside Judea and Samaria, um, and also a, um, uh, a huge uh, sorry, a deployment of U.S. forces into that area as well to protect Israel once the IDF had withdrawn. Um, I don't think that plan was viable uh, in any way. Uh, I think, in my opinion, yes, of course, technical capabilities must be relied on as much as possible, and some of the ideas in there were very good and should be used, but I don't believe in the foreseeable future the existence of Israeli troops on the Jordan Valley and able to operate throughout Judea and Samaria, able to operate, not necessarily permanently operating. I don't think that is uh, in any way conducive to, uh, to the security of the state of Israel. Anyone who knows the geography can see how vulnerable uh, enemy held areas in that country, how vulnerable that makes Israel. And one of the, one of the, um, the, the, the part, one part of the, the US peace proposals is that a future Palestinian state in areas of Judea and Samaria would be demilitarized, so it wouldn't have its own security forces. It would have, obviously, internal security forces, as it does today, but it wouldn't have defense forces in the more traditional sense, and that would be, remain the responsibility of Israel. Um, and, and I think, you know, all, all we need to do is look and see where Jordan, the, the troops on the Jordan side of the border are facing which way they're facing. They're not facing Israel, they're facing into Jordan. Um, and I think that tells us all we need to know about the, you know, the, the, the way that the, the King of Jordan sees the security in the Jordan Valley. So I don't see that ever being something, not any time in the foreseeable future that can be, can be given up. Right, thank you for that answer. Uh, we're coming near to the end now, but I'd like to end up on what I would like to ascribe as being the broader picture. Uh, we're both admirers of Winston Churchill, who frequently spoke of uh, mankind working its way towards broader sunlit uplands. Uh, when he spoke of um, restoring a Jewish state to Palestine, he said it was an event that was not 
according to a few hundred years, but an event in, in, in the few thousand years of history which would stand out. And that he believed that the restoration of the Jews to their national home in Palestine would be good for them, good for the Arabs, good for the British, and good for the world. Now, um, as a, a Christian Zionist, do you believe that the, the working out of um, Jewish nationhood is, is part of God's plan, along with many members of the uh, Christians for Christians United for Israel? Do you, do you see things in a kind of religious context as well, or purely a here today context in world politics? Um, I, I, uh, one thing I would say, I am a Christian and I am a Zionist, but I don't class myself as a Christian Zionist. In other words, I don't necessarily hold to all of the tenets of, um, of people like Kufi and, and other mm. uh, Christian Zionist organisations. I don't disagree with them. I don't have a particular issue with them. But uh, my, my thinking behind this is not religious. Unlike Ord Wingate and, and other quite notable um, former Christian Zionists, I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't do this, I don't look at this from a religious perspective. Um, I have no doubt that the word of God uh, is exactly what he meant and will, it will transpire the way he intended it. Of course, there are different, uh, different understandings and interpretations of the word of God. Um, and I'm not a man of God, I'm not a clergyman, so I don't feel qualified to pronounce on it. But um, I, what, what I, I see, that I come at this from a perspective of, of more than anything else, of right and wrong. Um, I, I perceive that the state of Israel has a right to exist, just, as, just exactly as the United Kingdom has a right to exist, the United States of America, even France, I think, these days we consider to have a right to exist. Um, so, I, I, you know, I believe Israel does have a right to exist. And I also believe that the Palestinian Arabs who live in Israel and who live around that region in that, in, you know, in Judea and Samaria and in neighboring parts, they also have a right to be there and to live there safely pro in prosperity and in freedom. Um, and as I mentioned in one of my previous answers, I think that is not being prevented by the state of Israel. I think the you know, Israeli politicians over the generations have bent over backwards to accommodate uh, the Arab populations in those areas. Yes, of course, bad things have been done by all sides, but ultimately, I don't think that the plight of the Arabs in that region uh, can be attributed to, to malignity on the part of the state of Israel. I think more than anything else, we have to, we have to hold responsible their own leadership, going right the way back to the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, al Husseini, who from the beginning utterly opposed the existence of a Jewish state in that land, who went and spent the war in Nazi Germany cavorting with the likes of Hitler and Himmler and doing his best to persuade them to bring the Holocaust from Europe across to the Middle East. And his successors, including President Abbas and the leadership in Hamas, his successors look at it from the same perspective. They want to see the end of the state of Israel. They do not want a two-state solution. In my opinion, their leaders, I don't mean every single Palestinian, but the leadership does not want a two-state solution. They reject utterly a Jewish state. They intend to do everything they can, which may not be very much, to annihilate the Jewish state. And in the meantime, they want to make themselves as rich as they possibly can at the expense of their people. So that's the, the, the opposition that we're dealing with. And regrettably, those people around the world who quite understandably feel great sympathy for the Palestinian people, um, who support their perspective and who support that line, the line of the leadership, they are also to be held to account for the plight of the Palestinian Arab people. And as I said before, I think they're the ones I'm most concerned about. I know many Palestinian Arabs, um, and I have the utmost sympathy and respect for them. And I want to see them live in freedom and peace and prosperity. And they won't do so with the current leadership. And I think the best hope they've got is somehow to, to change their leadership. 
And I think that could happen possibly as a result of maybe a, a much further downstream long-term um, uh, result of the, these current peace proposals, depending on how they all unfold. But I, I'm not worried about the Jews. I'm not worried about the Israelis at all. I, I, I've been there many times. I understand their future. I understand their security. I know their, their future is safe and secure. Um, we should be more worried about the, the Arabs. Well, thank you. I think on, on that note, uh, we've held you captive for a whole hour. So I think uh, you've earned the right to go and have a beer. Um, um, unless there's anything else you'd like to say to us, I'd just like to, to wind up shortly. Is that, uh, you feel that that's enough now? Yeah, I'm yes. more than happy. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to you for inviting me to do this. I'm extremely even more grateful to those people who had the patience to listen to my voice for the last hour plus. Um, and I, I, I have to say, I'll say in conclusion that um, I, I, I know many members of uh, the Jewish community in the UK, across the UK, including in, in Chigwell. And um, uh, I, have, I have great admiration for um, the contributions that you make to this country, as I said before. I also have great admiration for the, the contribution that the state of Israel makes to makes for us and makes to us rather and I, I would all I would do is to kind of going back to the question we spoke of before is to is to urge members of the Jewish community just to speak up um, on behalf of the state of Israel or in support of the state of Israel in whatever way they see fit but not in any way to be afraid to um, to, to to demonstrate their understanding because I, I know many many other people in this country uh, want to have want to drown them out want to have their voices heard rather than members of the Jewish community or anybody else who supports the state of Israel. Well, thank you very much we were very fortunate in the 1930s as I mentioned at the beginning to um, have such a great uh, advocate on our behalf as uh, Colonel Josiah Wedgwood and uh, now in the uh, year in the 2020 and the years before, we're equally fortunate to have had you as such a great advocate on our behalf. And really, our grateful thanks goes out to you for all that you've done to date and for addressing us tonight. And um, before we, we part, I just wonder whether I just also like to thank Rabbi Rafi, who's uh, made the technical um, effort to get us all shipshape tonight. Um, and to Lindsay Shaw, the chairman of the Chigwell and Hainan Synagogue, for uh, allowing us to um, be in partnership with him, and to Daniel Rosenberg, um, who, who has assisted me with the Jewish Historical Society. And if any of them would like to say something before we go, um, I'm happy to, to pass over to any of those three. Um, anyone there? I've never met a rabbi that doesn't want to speak. <laughs> I'll just, uh, I'm just trying to find the other participants. Oh, here we are. Thank you very much again. Uh, um, on behalf of those, I'll just say thank you on behalf of Daniel Rosenberg and Lindsay Shaw. And of course, thank you, Richard, for arranging it with them. And a massive thank you to Colonel Richard Kemp. It's actually the first time I've heard you somehow, even though I've seen your name all over the place. And uh, it was worth, worth the billing. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you and good night. Thank you and good night. Okay, cheerio. Cheers.